I'm all about spiritual recovery. That's my thing. I've been meditating from my first AA meeting. I started meditating. Uh, it's it's not evidently it's not common knowledge that the eleven step says sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God, as we understood it, praying only for knowledge of its will for us and the power to carry that out. Most people in AA with lots and lots of years, when I say we're going to do 20-minute meditation, are like, what? I can't sit still for 20 minutes. And I can't either. That's why I do it in a group, in a meeting, because it puts me in a box and I have to sit there for 20 minutes. Well, hello, friends of Bill W. and other friends. You have landed on Sober Speak. My name is John M. I am an alcoholic, and we are glad you are all here, especially newcomers. Newcomers, that is, both to recovery as a whole and newcomers to this podcast. Sober Speak is a podcast about recovery centered around the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. My job here on Sober Speak is simple. My job is to provide a platform to the amazing stories of recovery all around us. Consider Sober Speak, if you will, your meeting between meetings. Please remember, we do not speak for AA or any 12 step community. We represent only ourselves. We are here to share our experience, strength, and hope with those who wish to come along for the ride. Take what you want and leave the rest at the curb for the trash man to pick up. Hola, compadres, and greetings from Studio AA, deep in the heart of Texas. That thar at the beginning of this episode, number 328 was the voice of Mr. Randy M. And you are going to hear so much more from him in un momento. But first things first, this here episode is made possible by Natalie, Phil, Brad, and Emily. What you may ask did Natalie, Phil, Brad, and Emily do? Well, they went to our humble little website, www.soberspeak.com. They clicked on the little yellow donate tab and they made a, a contribution. So thank you so much, Natalie, Phil, Brad, and Emily. This here episode is coming right out to you. And if you all are out there today and you're feeling a little bit restless, irritable, and discontented, well, we are here to smooth out the edges of your day. All right, so let's get right on into Mr. Randy M. today. Randy M. is from Los Angeles, California, and this here episode is called Spiritual Recovery. Randy has been sober since February of 1988. That's 35 and almost 36 years for those of you who are keeping score at home, and uh, we begin with Randy uh, leading us through a third step prayer meditation very intentionally. Now, I want to let you know, just uh, in case you're driving or something like that, we don't uh, expect you to close your eyes and follow us through this, but uh, there's some silent spots in here where we're going through a meditation, and I love how Randy walks us through that. We discuss what an alcohol, what being an alcoholic means to Randy, the what he calls infantile ego, uh, the group of principles in Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, what it means to be happily and usefully whole, a spiritual progress rather than spiritual perfection, the applications of step one, steps one, two, and three, and much, much more. I know you're going to enjoy Randy, so sit back and enjoy the episode, and we will have plenty of listener feedback at the end of this here uh, episode. Okay, everybody, so today we are sitting here with Mr. Randy M. 
Uh, so Randy, I've just got a first things first. Why don't you go ahead, introduce yourself, give your sobriety date if you wish, and tell people where you live in this great land of ours, please. Sure. Great. Thank you. Thank you for having me here today. I'm excited to, to share this conversation with you and anyone else who might want to listen. My name is Randy. I am alcoholic. <laughs> I have been sober since February 28th, 1988. I'm in my 35th year of no drinking, no drugs. Wow. I live in Los oh. Angeles, by the way. You live in Los Angeles, yeah. And so I know you live in Los Angeles. Uh, it, the reason I know that is because we have a mutual friend uh, who introduced us, Mr. Brad L. How long have you and Brad known each other? Oh, my gosh. I don't know exactly how long, but I would say at least 10 years. Okay. At least 10 years, maybe a lot more. I, yeah, I can't. I'm I'm assuming you met him through meetings or how did you guys meet each other? Do you remember? I met him. I must have met him through meetings and I have a mutual friend. Brad's a big equine person, works with horses, yes. has horses. And uh, I met him through a friend that was also into horses. Wow. Yeah. So yeah, Brad is a great guy. We've been having a, a ton of conversations lately and I just, uh, he referred you over to me and then I was able to go in. So, you know, a lot of times I get referrals, right. From inter internal in the program, um, which is great. And then I, uh, you know, I like have to research them on the internet or whatever, see if they have like a public kind of tape out there. But you were really easy for me to kind of get a, a feeling for what kind of, uh, I don't know, what's important to you, what program you work on, because you have actually actually have a podcast yourself, right? So and what is the name of that podcast? That podcast is called Randy Mermel, Love Your Life. And, uh, it's available on Spotify. It's also available on Apple Podcasts. It's all over the place, I guess. So you, if you'll provide me a link after this, or maybe I could just use the one that I listened to it on from Spotify, and uh, we'll put it in the show notes, okay? So people can click on it and uh, um, make sure they have available. Oh, and also, if you want to reach out to me, John, J-O-H-N, at SoberSpeak.com, you can do that as well, and we'll get you in touch with Randy. So, okay, so... <clears throat> Before we started today, uh, this is the first time I had had this request, but I'm glad I did, and I thought it was a great idea. Randy asked if we could kind of take a pause and have a five-minute silent meditation, uh, which we did, and I enjoyed it very much, kind of helped to get me centered. Um, and so Randy is big into meditation. And I just know this from, from your podcast, from not from like many of the conversations we have, but talk to me about that. W when did that start? And what, how did that become a, I don't know, just a, a, such an important part of your life? You know, the crazy thing is, is that my very first meeting that I ever went to in AA was an 11 step meeting. And I showed up at that meeting with a brother of mine that brought me into the program. He suggested I might want to check it out. <laughs> it, now, is that an actual brother, brother, or gotcha? Yeah, he uh, he had gone through treatment and gotten sober, and uh, he suggested it might be something that I would could look into. Might be good for me. <laughs> so I went with him. It was a Tuesday night meeting in Miami, Florida, and I went, and the uh, the lady there, her name was Jenny. She was from New York. I don't, I don't know if she's still alive. That was a long time ago. Um, but she would read how it works, and then she would uh, describe a simple form of meditation, which I'm still using the same meditation today, and... Uh, and then we would meditate, and then we would everybody would share. And, you know, there were like four or five people at that meeting on a regular basis. <laughs> okay, so what I want you to do here kind of before we start today, sure. uh, before we, I mean, we've already started, but before we kind of get further into your story, is I've heard you do this on your podcast, and I absolutely love the way that you present it 
uh, it's the third step prayer. And I think it would be a great idea for you to do that on this uh, episode so people can kind of get a, a, a flavor, uh, if, or, or excuse me, a taste of what you do. And, um, and then we'll just kind of go on from there. Are you good with doing that? Sure. Sounds great. I love the third step prayer. Okay. So what I would encourage you to do is just to get comfortable. I like to sit with my feet flat on the floor and I like to turn my palms up towards the ceiling and rest them gently on the top of my thighs. When I'm praying and when I'm meditating, uh, it's just kind of an open posture. And then we're going to do the prayer. I'm going to encourage you to do it along with me. We're going to do the prayer one breath at a time, one line at a time. And then in between each line of the prayer, we're going to take a few breaths to actually try to do what the prayer is asking us to do and not do what it's asking us to not do. So take a few breaths just on your own. Take a few breaths. So for me, the first line of the third start prayer is the word God. So I breathe in the word God and I take a few breaths. And I believe what the prayer is asking me to do is to connect with this thing we call God. You can call it higher power, infinite intelligence, whatever works for you, doesn't care. But take a few breaths and continue to call out to this thing like you would call out to a friend that you were trying to get their attention. And when I'm ready, I breathe in the next line of the prayer. I offer myself to thee. Again, I take a few breaths. And I look at my commitment to that statement. I ask myself, really? Do I really, right here, right now, offer myself to my higher power? And I breathe out to build with me and to do with me as thou will. And I take a few breaths. And I try to see if there isn't a sense or a feeling or a knowing of what my higher power might want to do with me or build with me today, right now. And I breathe out, relieve me of the bondage of self. And I take a few breaths and I try to see what it might sound like or feel like or be like if I had no bondage of self, no story, no opinion, no old ideas, just an open, quiet mind. And I breathe in, that I may better do thy will. Again, I take a few breaths and I contemplate how much better could I do God's will if I truly had an open, quiet mind. Yeah. 
And I breathe out, take away my difficulties. And I take a few breaths. And I look over my day today so far. And I try to see what have been my difficulties. What have been the things that have gotten in the way of me being the person that I think my higher power would have me be? And I breathe in, that victory over them may bear witness to those I would help of thy power, thy love, and thy way of life. And I take a few breaths, and I consider the rest of my day today, and I think about the people I might come in contact with, and I think about how I might affect those people if I truly was an example of God's power, God's love, and God's way of life. And I breathe out the last line of the prayer. May I do thy will always. And I allow myself to smile. And I take a few breaths. And I try to picture myself doing God's will right here, right now, always. And whenever you're ready, you can gently open your eyes. <laughs> Amen. Amen, Mr. Randy. So, okay, so now I got to kind of come back and be, uh, uh, you know, ask questions and, and talk to you and stuff like that. But that is, so what I'm hoping from that is that if we affect one person and their spiritual contact with God uh, and get it closer to the God of their understanding, I will have considered that a big success. And I know that that's going to happen. And, and also, I'm hoping that people will just, uh, well, one or two things, they'll hear that and then be able to rewind it and use it on a consistent basis whenever they wake up in the morning or whenever they go to bed at night or whenever they need to kind of relax during the day or they just go to your uh to your podcast and they can hear i think you start every podcast with it if I'm, every episode with it am i not mistaken good good that's great Okay, so let's talk about Randy a little bit. So obviously, I'm assuming you weren't doing that when you came into the rooms of AA. <laughs> no, that's, that's a new that's a new installment. Uh, I just recently, uh, for myself, uh, slowed down and said that prayer. It started actually with the eleven step prayer, because the book tells you specifically to do what we just did with the third step prayer. With the eleven step prayer and the twelve and twelve, it says, "Now we go back and we read it one line at a time, and we mm. think about how that might affect us or others." And and so I started doing this a guided meditation at some of my meetings with the eleven step prayer, and then I I it occurred to me that that is a great way to pray. For, and I, I thought prayer was something that you did kind of to interrupt your mind to distract you from whatever was bothering you. And so you just said words, you know, and the words were a prayer and they were good words, uh, better than what I was talking to myself about at the moment. And it would distract me. And that, that was praying. And I thought that that was praying. But I think that the prayer, the purpose of the prayer is to change the, the man that I am in the moment that I'm praying. 
And, and so I find that if I slow it down and I actually try to do what it's asking me to do in the prayer, in the moment that I'm trying to do it, that I can actually be changed. Uh, I don't know if you said these exact words during this one, but I've heard you say it on your podcast before. And that was, um, and I've used this both in meetings and walking around during the day. And, uh, but the, the line was, what would it look like? If I actually did turn my will and my life over the care of God, as I understand, what, what, I mean, just, just that, just that simple phrase on the front end of all the, you know, what would it look like if I, uh, you know, did God's will uh, always or, and it, it just really, uh, it struck a note with me. And that's why I wanted to get you on, right? And, and have a, a, a conversation with you. Um, Okay, so give me a thumbnail sketch. I, you know, I, I, I think I want to spend more time with you talking about, you know, like the now and uh, you know, and, and stuff like that, the stuff that I know you're really interested in, right? And the busyness that goes on in our head, but to kind of qualify, if you will, why don't you give me a thumbnail sketch of, of how you got here? Sure, sure. So, uh, okay, so uh, this is my drunk log. The first time I drank, drank, really drank, went out into the woods with some friends with a couple of bottle of Boone's Farm wine and Southern Comfort and got drunk. The, I was about 13 years old. We went out into the woods. I had the time of my life. I drank until I got so sick. I threw up everywhere. I was so excited that I threw up because that meant I could start drinking again. And that was my first time that I remember really drinking. Uh, that's how I started. At the end, I spent the last two months of my drinking career on vacation in Los Angeles. Uh, I was visiting with a girlfriend, uh, and, uh, every day I was going to go out and see some friends and not drink and get out of the house. And every day at lunch, I just, you know, lunch was when I woke up at, you know, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock in the afternoon, I woke up, I figured I'd have one beer and that'd be that, and I'd have a beer, and then I'd get on the phone, and I'd get some cocaine, and I did not leave that apartment for two months. And <laughs> I spent the whole two months watching the crack under the door because I was sure someone was coming to get me. And uh, <laughs> and that's it. That's it. I drank. I always drank like the first time I drank, and and uh, that's how it ended. That that was that was it. Um, and I've heard you before say, you know, I'm an alcoholic and that means that, explain yeah. that because I love how you put it. Yeah, I always identify the same way. I'm alcoholic. I'm not an alcoholic. I am alcoholic. I'm allergic to alcohol. That's what it means to me to be alcoholic. I'm allergic to alcohol. I can never, ever drink alcohol successfully again, not because alcohol is good or bad, but because I am physically allergic to it. If I drink it, I'm going to drink until I black out. I'm going to drive, which means I'm probably going to crash my car or possibly worse, you know, kill somebody or hurt somebody and myself. I'm going to trash all of the relationships that I have with the people I'm in relationships with now. I'm going to lose my job. I'm going to lose my place to live and my family's going to want nothing to do with me. So that's what happens if I take a first drink because of the allergy. But that's not why I stay in Alcoholics Anonymous because the obsession to drink has been left it. And, and I thought that's what the steps were for. And I thought that because the obsession had been rel relieved that I, uh, that I had treated the disease and now it, it was about getting busy to get all the things that my mind told me were the things that would make me happy. But, but what I found was that I have alcoholism. I have a disease. And the disease centers in my mind, the disease talks to me in my own voice, and the disease manifests as an unsatisfiable, fault-finding, opinionated mind that's coupled with this infantile ego. And the infantile ego is always in a hurry, easily frustrated, and can't stand the word no. <laughs> 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 so imagine you have a mind and my mind tells me, uh, Randy, you need a new car. And I think, yeah, that's a great idea. My car's five years old. I need a new car. I should get a new car. And then I'm off to the races. All I can do is see new cars. I'm picking colors. I'm picking cars. I'm at work. I'm on the internet night and day 
not working, looking at cars, <laughs> trying to figure out the best deal. And I'm all about cars because my mind keeps telling me you need a new car, you need a new car, you need a new car. The minute I buy that new car, the same mind and the same voice says, you're an idiot, Randy. You didn't need a new car. Now you have a car payment. Now you now you got to pay for that car and you don't have the money for a new car. Why would you do that? You're so stupid. And the same mind that told me what a great idea a new car is, is the mind that's telling me I'm an idiot for doing it. And it does it with everything. Okay, so let's talk about that a little bit, because I know that this is an area that you've really delved into, right? And I know Brad talks about it a lot, too, and that is the mind and the tricks it plays on us and the thought process that, that goes on internally. What what have you found out about that? What, what, what do you... Um, I, I, just talk about that whole area of that self-talk that goes on inside your brain. Well, I kind of feel like it's part of being human, you know. Uh, it, for me, it's extremely dangerous because it will get me. W that self-talk is always negative. Even when it's positive, it soon turns negative, right? I had an experience once where uh, I was getting into the shower because the shower is the most torturous place on the planet if I'm not careful. <laughs> Because that's where my <laughs> mind really talks to me. I was getting in the shower, and I had this great idea. I should put some money in my daughter's uh, 529 college fund. Great idea. And then I got in the shower, and I started talking to myself about where am I going to get that extra money for that, fi for that 529. <laughs> and then I started talking to myself about the guys that work for me and how they're not working hard enough, and I need to get them to work harder. And then maybe I just need to get rid of those guys and get a whole new set of guys. <laughs> And then I'll have more money. And then it turns on my wife and says, maybe you need a new wife. Maybe your <laughs> wife spends too much money and that's why you don't have enough money. And now it's talking to me about divorce. So now it's told me to <laughs> kill everybody at work, get rid of my wife. And by the time I get out of that shower, I want to commit suicide. <laughs> <laughs> that's the mind that I have. That's And I call that alcoholism. You can call it whatever you want. I don't. I don't particularly, I don't. I always say this, I hope you don't have what I have. Mm. The book talks about in the meetings uh, it, that's read at every meeting, and, and it says, uh, there are those two that have grave emotional and mental disorders. And I, I am guilty every time I hear that sentence read in a meeting, I look around and I'm like, oh yeah, there's one, there's another one. Oh yeah, that guy <laughs> has grave emotional mental disorders. <laughs> <laughs> and then one day I realized, you know, I'm always sitting in that room. <laughs> I, I are one. Right? I think yeah. that was Bill Wilson's way of gently letting me know that I have grave emotional and mental disorder. Because <laughs> you know there are some of us, some of the, uh, I just happen to be there every time that's read. So I, I think I have grave emotional and mental disorders. So... You know that that monkey mind, whatever you call it, right? It, it, it's it, the Grand Central Station in the head, uh, uh, and you know, I know you said it. it alcoholism, you know, in, in my opinion, is like everybody has it, right? But we deal with alcohol to kind of soothe that. But how? What kind of methods? What have you found that? helps us slow that down. Uh, you know, and obviously our primary purpose is to stay, to stay sober, right? So you want to stay sober, you know, you know, you're not going to eliminate it if you're not sober, but then kind of, how do you slow that down and, and, and create a conscious contact with the God of your understanding? So I'm going to start back just a little bit because I don't think Alcoholics Anonymous is, is a way to stop drinking. The, all of the instructions for not drinking basically go, ask a higher power to help you not drink today and go to a meeting, right? I mean, right. not one of the steps addresses alcohol except for the first step that says, I'm powerless over it. That's all it says. There's no instructions to stop drinking. What Alcoholics Anonymous is and what the 12 steps is, is it's a way of life that if I live this way of life, I never need to drink again. Because alcoholism keeps me in a state of restless, irritable, and discontent. That's words from a book. 
but that's my life. I see it in my life. With 35 years of sobriety, my self-talking mind in five minutes can make me very uncomfortable, very, very uncomfortable. And so I have to practice these principles, just what it says in the beginning of the 12 and 12. AA's 12 steps are a group of principles which, if practiced as a way of life, can expel my obsession to drink and enable me to be happily and usefully whole. That's all I want. I just want to be happily and usefully whole. I just want to be able to enjoy this moment, whatever it is. Alcoholism is always saying, when you get there, you'll be happy. But there is no there there. Everybody's getting there. When I get the car, when I get the wife, when I get the car, when I get the job, when I get the new house, everyone's trying to get there to be happy. And that's how the disease keeps you sick because there is no there. When you get the house, now you need the wife. When you get the wife, now you need the car. When you get the house, the wife, and the car, all the, now you have too many responsibilities and you <laughs> want to go back to when you lived in a one-bedroom apartment by yourself. And so <laughs> it's always looking for there. There is no there. It's here. <laughs> and so, yeah. So the, so the 12 steps, it, the weirdest thing is, I always thought the 12 steps said, I, I just made this up in my mind because it obviously doesn't say this on paper, but I thought the 12 steps said, now that I haven't drank for a long time and I've done these 12 chores that my sponsor made me do and I've been a good boy. Now I should have the right car and the right job and the right house and the right wife, and I should be happy. <laughs> and, and it doesn't say that. It says having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps. <laughs> and, and, and in the fourth step, it says, when we straighten out spiritually, we straighten out mentally and physically, not the other way around. Right. right. Um. I was talking to a guy who's actually out in your area. I, I don't know if you know him, Adam, a Adam, gosh, I can't remember his last, I think it's T. Yeah. I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and he, yeah, he, and he is a trip and I was talking to him once and this was actually not on the podcast, even though we did an episode, it was, a uh, uh, kind of one-on-one -on -one offline. And, and he said to me some, and I've never forgot this. He says, I've worked, uh, he says, you see this all the time that people, they will, they'll, they'll want a job and then they'll get that job. And then as soon as they get that job, within about six months or a year, they start looking around and say, well, wait a sec, why is this person making more than I am? And you know, why, why are they getting a promotion? And I'm not, all of a sudden that job that they wanted is a, a, a source of stress and it's a source of uh, angst for them. And uh, it, it sounds similar to what you were talking about there. Um. Okay, so he, so here's what I was thinking of, though, while you were talking, and that is, I I understand that, right? And I, th I think everybody gets it. You know, you got to slow down that mind and, and keep it from going all over the place. But when you have like somebody, maybe you're sponsoring, right? And they call you and they say, yeah, well, the 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 wife's not doing what she's supposed to be doing and you know the job is not you know doing uh, it, it, it's not going well and you know maybe my health is going bad or whatever and you try to get them to slow down what is kind of some practical kind of uh, suggestions that you would give to them yeah that's a good question um so uh, there's no tricks i wish there were tricks and I, there's no tricks to being restored to sanity. The first step says that I admit complete defeat. And it says in the 12 and 12 that the, the principle, people are always saying, what are these principles? It actually calls out the first principle. I'll read it because otherwise I'll make it up. The principle that I shall find no enduring strength until I first admit complete defeat is the main taproot from which our whole society has sprung and flowered. So the first mm. principle that I have to practice in my life is admitting that I am a complete defeat, not an alcohol defeat, a complete defeat. It doesn't mean that I'm, it's not defeatism, but it's acknowledging that on my own power, I am a complete defeat at being okay in this day no matter which way it goes, whether I get everything I want or I don't. 
I'm still a complete defeat at being okay in this moment on my own power. And mm -hmm. the last sentence in the, in the 12 and 12 in the first step says, I stand ready to do anything, anything that will lift my merciless obsession. So I'm not mercilessly obsessed to drink alcohol anymore. I am mercilessly obsessed on a daily basis to be self-satisfied, to eat the right lunch, to have the right car, to have the right job, to have the right amount of money in the bank. So that's my merciless obsession today. If you're still mercilessly obsessed about alcohol, the uh, only thing I could tell you is to ask a higher power to help you not drink and to ask a higher power to remove your obsession. It's the same thing with the mind. Because the second step, if I admit complete defeat and I stand ready to do anything, I have to do the thing I least want to do in the whole world, which is I have to start coming to believe that there's a power that's greater than me. And that that power, the one that's greater than me, is the one that's going to restore me to sanity. So I have to stop that self-talking monkey mind, you call it the monkey mind, I, I'd call it alcoholism. That self-talking mind is the thing that's always trying to restore me to sanity. It's telling me, you, have, you get the right car, you'll be okay. You, you just got the wrong color. You need to get the other color. And then you get the other color and then it's a different car. And it's always telling me what it would be that would make me okay. That's me trying to restore me to sanity. And it doesn't work because obviously if I could restore myself to sanity, we would not be having this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to have yes. to, Yeah. So it's always coming back to that, you know, even with our, with our mind, right. And, and, uh, I don't know if you call this advanced AA or deep stuff or whatever, but you know, it's the same thing, you know, I mean, uh, in fact, talk to me about that because people will say, you know, Hey, we're just here to stay sober or whatever the case may be, you know? Uh, but you know, Bill Wilson makes it clear that this is a spiritual kindergarten and we have to go, you know, do some extra searching and extra finding and extra seeking. So what do you say to those people that say, you know, it's just about staying. It is our primary purpose. We get that right. But what do you say to that crowd? I say, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say I hope you don't have what I have because just staying sober is incredibly painful and I know people with 28 years of sobriety that have blown their brains out and there are lots of people with lots of time that have jumped off of stools in their closets and choked themselves to death and mm -hmm. and all and and all they're trying to do is to quiet that mind if the mind would shut up they wouldn't have to jump off the stool right <laughs> so <laughs> So this the the disease is an ongoing progressive mind powered disease. I think that I think there's one word in the big book, one word that needs to be changed and I think it's one word that is more it's I think it's very damaging to recovery. It's in how it works. It's read at every meeting. And I know this is controversial, I don't care because it might save somebody's life. It says remember that we deal with alcohol cunning, baffling, and powerful. And I say, no, no. Remember, I have to remember that I deal with alcoholism. Alcoholism is cunning, baffling, and powerful because alcoholism will, will get me to drink alcohol, which for me is a known poison because I'm allergic to it. And I have all of this track record of every time I drank for years, it went badly. But my mind will still tell me that drinking anything is better than the pain that my mind has got me in now. So the mind that's got the disease is telling me I need to drink alcohol to stop the disease. And then you know what happens the minute you drink alcohol? The same mind in the same voice says, why did you do that? You mm -hmm. can't drink. And then it says, well, you drank, so you might as well just get plastered. And then right. the whole thing starts over again. So if just drinking is, is the name of the game, just don't drink. I'm happy for you. That's not my experience. I, don't, I, don't, I can't live with my mind, with my alcoholism, by just not drinking. It's not enough for me. If it's enough for you, God bless you. You are such a lucky man. I, I'm happy. I, I say congratulations if you can just stay sober no matter what. 
you know, we, we deal with alcoholism. We deal with a disease that centers in our mind that never goes away. I'm 35 years sober, almost 36 years sober. I still wake up. Now, I want to say this. I have the best life I've ever known. Um, I just got back from London where I led a retreat. I got to travel all over Europe after that, after that retreat. I'm back here for a week. I'm going to Nashville next week to lead a men's retreat. I travel all over the world for that. I have a great job. I have a beautiful wife I've been married to for 23 years. I have a beautiful life. I have more money in the bank than I ever had, ever. But I still have alcoholism. I still have a disease. I still have a mind that tells me they're cheating me at work. They're giving the good leads to the other guys. And I deserve them more than them. And I still have to quiet that mind or I will walk into work and tell them they can have their damn job and I'll tell them where to put it and I'll walk right out of there from the best job I ever had because my <laughs> mind made up a story about who's getting the best leads. Talk to me about those retreats. What what do you do on those retreats? What, what are you leading? What is it like? Is it alcoholics? Is it other people? Yep. Is it a mix of things? It's mixed. It's 12 steps. Anybody working a 12-step program is welcome to the retreats. Uh, the one I'm doing in Nashville is a men's retreat for men, and it's put on by a group out of Nashville. And uh, I've been going to that group for 10 years. Last year, they had me lead the whole retreat. This year, I'm leading the retreat again. In so is it yeah. kind of a traditional, so it doesn't sound like a traditional conference. Like, g give me a, like a, a, a structure. What, what happens during these retreats? So a lot of meditation, a lot of prayer, and a lot of talk about steps and a, a lot of talk about how to apply the steps, but also they're in a place usually that's quiet, that's peaceful. So most of the time they're sleepover retreats where you go to a retreat and you sleep there. And so it allows you to get off the grid and really delve into this spiritual way of life with no distractions. I, I, I'm all about spiritual recovery. That's my thing. I've been meditating from my first AA meeting. I started meditating. Uh, it's, it's not, evidently, it's not common knowledge that the 11th step says, sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood it, praying only for knowledge of its will for us and the power to carry that out. Most people in AA with lots and lots of years, when I say we're going to do 20 minute meditation, are like, what? I can't sit still for 20 minutes, and I can't either. That's why I do it in a group, in a meeting, because it puts me in a box, and I have to sit there for 20 minutes. And 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 it changes the meetings. The meetings, I, I lead two meetings a week on Wednesdays and Saturdays at 11 a.m. Pacific time on Zoom. Yeah, and, and are those, those are Zoom, right? They're Zoom. They're called Principles yeah. in Application. That's the name of the meetings. They so if somebody wanted to find those, how would they find it? Principles and applications uh, on the web? Yeah, if you go, there's a Facebook group you can ask to join. It's a private group. So there's a Facebook group called Principles in Application. You can go to my website, randymermel.com. Why don't you spell that for him? Randy, the last name. R-A-N-D-Y, Mermel, M-E-R-M-E-L-L.com. And then you can click on meetings and it'll it'll give you the meetings. There's a there's a Monday, Tuesday, Thursday principles and application meeting that start with 10 minutes of meditation and they're they're kind of joint with another group and I, I don't lead those. I lead the Wednesday and the Saturday meetings. My principles and application meetings always start with 20 minutes of meditation. That's the best part of the whole meeting. If that's all you can make, just come for that because group meditation is awesome. Uh, then we do the third step prayer or the seven step prayer. On Wednesdays, we talk about the principles embodied in the first three steps. On Saturdays, we talk about, we, we reading through the big book in the 12 and 12 for all of the steps. And we're deep into the ninth step right now. And once again, I'm going to have Randy, if, if you can't write all that down, I'm going to put the links in the show notes. You know, I mean, sometimes people are draw, driving or whatever. So I'll put, I'll, put, I'll put them in the show notes or you could just rewind it and listen to it again. Um, another thing I wanted to ask you about is that I've, I've really been um, listening a lot to the, the power of now guy. What's his name? Uh, 
Yeah, Eckhart Tolle lately, and it is and it sounds similar to some of the things you do. Is is that something that uh, you subscribe to, or you like it? Don't like it? Yeah, I love Eckhart Tolle. I uh, I've been I've saw him speak live once here in Los Angeles, and I've read the book probably twenty times, and I've listened to it on tape a million times. Huh. And wow, uh, it's. You know, spiritual principles are spiritual principles. It doesn't matter if Eckhart Tolle's talking about them, the Catholic Church is talking about them. Uh, it, a spiritual principle is a truth upon which all other truths are based. And so it doesn't, it doesn't matter where you find it. I mean, I read Sermon on the Mount for 15 years. I read two pages out of that book every morning. There's some great practical application of spiritual principles in that book. It's great. I'm not Christian per se, but you just work around and it's all God. It's all God. God is God. There is one that has all power. You can call it whatever you want. It used to be if you use the wrong name for God, it offended me. Today I understand that all you're talking about, you're just, you have a name for it. You call it God. There's a guy in AA, he calls his higher power Murray. And <laughs> <laughs> I don't care what you call it. Just use it. Just use it to restore you to sanity, whatever it is. I know a guy who calls him Bob because he 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 thinks of him as kind of like a a like Bob Newhart, and that is like his God, you know. And as long as it works, right? It doesn't, matter. It doesn't care. I don't think it cares what you call it. I don't think so either. I don't think so either. So, my friend, um, what sort of, I guess, parting message do you have here? I guess I'm looking for, you know, you have a lot of people listening to you right now. Um, some of them are, some of them are struggling just to stay sober. Um, others are incarcerated. Uh, you have people listening that are, they've been doing this for a while. Um, but if you were to kind of sum up from your experience, strength, and hope, what you believe about the 12 steps uh, and spirituality and um, what you would like to leave people with in, in terms of what you want them to know and to kind of grasp onto, what would you say? Well, there's a line in How It Works. It says this. Uh, we claim spiritual progress rather than spiritual perfection. And I think most of the time that you hear that, usually the person is saying, hey, I'm not perfect. But that's not what the sentence is saying. It's saying that we claim spiritual progress. And so, Willing to go to any length is any length. It's not any length. It's any <laughs> length. <laughs> Are you willing to just do a little prayer? Are you willing to meditate two minutes, five minutes? Are you willing to open the book and read something? So are you willing to claim any spiritual progress today? No, we're never going to be perfect. I'm never, you ask my wife, I'm not even close. I'm so far from perfect, it's insane. But, Me too, brother. Right? <laughs> But yeah. today I claim a little bit of spiritual progress. And real quick, I'm just I'll just recap steps one, two, and three as application for for so step one is I admit I'm I'm a complete defeat at being okay in this moment. So the reason I'm not okay right now is because me personally, with my mind, I'm a complete defeat at being okay right now. Step two, I'm gonna come to believe right now more that there's a power and that that power that's greater than me is the one that's going to restore me to sanity. The last line in the 12 and 12 says, every AA meeting is an assurance that God will restore me to sanity if I rightly relate myself to it. So the first step is admitting that I can't fix myself. The second step is rightly relating myself to my higher power, which to me means talking to it. So I would suggest you just start telling God where you're at. God, this is where I'm at. I'm full of fear. I'm afraid my wife doesn't love me anymore. I'm afraid that the other guys at work are getting the better leads and that I'm going to go broke and be alone. I'm afraid that I live in the wrong house in the wrong neighborhood. I'm afraid that 
people don't like me at meetings. Whatever my fears are, whatever my hopes are, whatever my ambitions are, whatever's happening to me in front of me right now, I talk that over with my higher power. I put my attention on my higher power. In this moment, God, could you be with me? Could you help me to be the man that you want me to be? Could you guide me and direct me? And when I do that for long enough, I, my mind gets quiet. And I call that quietness sanity. There's still stuff going on around me is insane. People die. People get sick. I got COVID. Uh, things happen. But while they're happening, if I'm rightly relating myself to my higher power, I can have some peace in this moment right now. When I have enough moments of peace, then I'm qualified to make a decision. And I can make a decision right now to turn my will and my life, my thoughts and my actions over to the care of God as I understood it. Because it's understood by me now that when I rightly relate myself to my higher power, my mind gets quiet. And or when I rightly relate myself to myself, I get more insane. It gets louder and crazier. So I can make the decision now. I'm qualified. And that's how I understand my higher power, that it quiets my mind when I need it. And that's the beginning of having a little bit of peace right now. And that's what I need. And that helps me to be happily and usefully whole in this moment. So that's the beginning message. I, I've heard you say that actually on your podcast before, is that, uh, isn't that really what I want is peace of mind, mm -hmm. you know, and what leads me to that? And I just, you know, you kind of said that basically there a moment ago, and that, that's really what I'm looking for is peace of mind. So this has been great, my friend. I'm going to read from page 164 of the big book to close this out. It says, abandon yourself to God as you understand God. And we've talked about so much of this already. Admit your faults to him and to your fellows. Clear away the wreckage of your past. Give freely of what you find and join us. We shall be with you in the fellowship of the Spirit, and you will surely meet some of us, like me and Randy, as you trudge the road of happy destiny, may God bless you and keep you until then. Randy, God bless you, my friend. I'm doing a little namaste hands to him. You all can't see it, but uh, thank you so much. Uh, this helped me in my day. This is going to help to uh, uh, improve my spiritual walk. I needed to kind of calm down, so to speak, from the things that were going on in my little monkey mind today. And uh, I'm so glad we were, able to, we were able to spend this time together. Hope to see you again soon. Hope to get you, meet you uh, in real, uh, like face to face here. One of the, are, are you scheduled to come to Texas for any sort of, uh, uh, no, not right now, right? Yeah, but I'm open to it. If somebody wants to put it together, I'll be there. <laughs> I agree. That sounds good. So if you're in Texas and you want to drive this event, I'll sponsor it. Uh, and maybe we can get Randy here and uh, um, have a, uh, a good meditation type retreat. God bless you, my friend. And thank you again. Thank you, Randy, for taking time out of your day to share your experience, strength, and hope with the listeners of Sober Speak here. Uh, I know that's going to have a positive impact on many people. And now if you're out there and you're listening, remember, we don't want you sharing your gossip and we don't want you sharing your toothbrush, but we would love for you to share this episode with a friend or family member. It may be just what they need today. So pause your little device, hit that share button and get it on over to whoever you think may benefit from that. Thanks again, Randy. Now, on to a little bit of a listener feedback. Billy writes in and Billy says, Hi, John. I have been sober six months. Uh, I went back to jail for my drinking, but now I am at a halfway house. I just wanted to thank you for your podcast and putting Sober Speak in my phone as it helps me in recovery 
as you know, one day at a time. Well, good for you, Billy. I'm glad you're back on track there, and I'm glad we can be a small part of your recovery journey. God bless you, my friend. Phil writes in and Phil says, hi, John, my name is Phil B. I'm from Boston. The spirit just moved me enough to set up a recurring donation to your show. Thank you very much, Phil. Uh, And then he says, okay, enough of my modesty. (laughs) The reason for my emailing is one of gratitude. In short, I was sober through AA and God for 16 years. I made the decision to pick up late in 2019, a decision that nearly cost me my life. My higher power aligned me with you in jail. Upon entry, I was given a tablet, which your podcast was on free of charge. And he says, good move on their part. Ha ha. (laughs) I guess that is a good move. He says, listening to your annoying ass... (laughs) Listening to your annoying ass voice from deep in the heart of Texas, along with your incredible speakers, was instrumental in getting me through my time. Your wit, insight, and selfless acts of service resonated with me and still do today as I sit here sober. Thank you, John, for your work, for being there for me when I needed it the most. Phil, well, God bless you, Phil. Um both you and Billy. Uh, I'm glad both of you are back on the right track. And I'm, I'm once again, I'm so part, I guess, so thankful that we here at the podcast can be a, a small part of your journey in recovering. God bless you up there in Boston, Phil. I appreciate you. Oliver writes in and Oliver says, hi, John. So I'm an alcoholic and that's not a definition statement. And puts a big smiley face. I've got it all right, but it's n- but it's not who God intends me to be. I'm so much more than so many uh, to so many more. I have two boys from two different relationships, and they are both equally awesome, despite all of my involvement and non-involvement. I'm currently employed, and that's also not a strange thing for me. Been trudging the road of happy destiny for uh, around 12 years. Yes, I'm a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. Everything wasn't always like this, as you have come to know from so many other members. Been jailed and sentenced to be in prison before for drug and alcohol related crimes out here in, uh, out here in sunny South Africa. All that in the past and I've gone through heaps of problems with losing income and made it through with God and family helping. I'm sober and I had a spiritual awakening as a result as the result of these steps. I carry and have carried the message to many people over the years. I've learned how to follow instructions in the book and how awesome it is to have a relationship with God. I go to two regular meetings a week and I cheer one online. Sponsees, I have one at the moment. I don't have a person that sponsors me in the steps and you and the Sober Speak Voices have answered a lot of questions I ask for in prayer. Funny how that happens. I listen to about five shares a week from the different podcasts. I still do prayer and meditation every morning. I also practice 11 and 12 uh, and as it happens and how God presents the opportunity. Sober Speak I found through Spotify and Instagram. I messaged you on Instagram and you've replied to me a couple of times. Yeah, I remember you, Oliver. He says, if you're interested in deflating the ego and letting God in, I'm with you. Tons and heaps to learn as I'm still nothing without God. And he teaches and guides for as long as I'm accepting him in humble gratitude toward his will for us. It's good to be home with people that don't want credentials or awards first, but would rather take firsthand experience after meeting you. We've been Uh, around long enough to know what we've not been around long and wait we've been around long enough to know and that 
we've not been around long enough. Thank you for letting me in the super secret Facebook group, Oliver. Well, Oliver, it, the, 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 the pleasure is all ours and I'm glad you are in there. And just in case you're out there listening for the first time and you're wondering, how do I get into the super secret Facebook group? Well, you go to Facebook and you search up sober speak secret group and ask for admission admission in there and we will get you on in the group ralph writes in and the title the subject line is david g step study episode 325 he says hi john i'm very grateful for having found sober speak i listen on a regular basis throughout my day sometimes in the same episodes since they are so full of experience experiences, hopes, and strength. We are blessed to be here. Can you share information on David G's step study? I'm unclear if it's an online or in-person study. Thanks. Ralph D. Sober since May 29th of two. Th- oh, May 29th. That's my uh, sober date there, Ralph. Anyway, May 29th of sober, May 29th of 2004, and then he's from the Sober on the Hill men's group in Brooklyn, New York. So if you're from Brooklyn, New York, and you go to the Sober on the Hills men group, give Ralph my best. But uh, as you know, I got you in touch with David. I know he does it once a year. I think this one is kind of like in the middle of the step study right now, but I'm sure he'll have more uh, or at least have another one next year. Karen writes in and she says, hello, John. I live in San Antonio, Tejas. Uh, she, she didn't say Tejas. I, I said Tejas. It's actually just Texas. But anyway, she says, I've been in Al-Anon since May of 2019. And one of my sponsees told me about the podcast and that my great grand sponsor, Benoit S., was on episode number 147. Yes, she was on our podcast podcast love Vinoy. uh she says i love hearing Vin- Vinoy's voice so i had to listen to that episode i would listen from time to time when i was going on trips or long walks uh, recently my job went back to working in the office and i love listening to sober speak uh, during my commute it really helps me to keep focused on my program uh instead of getting caught up in resentment i attend uh, Al-Anon and AA meetings. I grew up in al- I grew up in an alcoholic home, and I was married to an alcoholic and never really understood the disease. I came to Al-Anon because I was desperate, because de- I was desperate, depressed, and didn't know what else to do. That's usually when people end up in AA or Al-Anon. I get it. She says my life has changed in amazing ways since then. Alcoholism takes its toll on the whole family, and alcohol was uh, only a symptom of the disease. And then she said, recently I heard Mary Lynn B's episode and I loved her music so much that I bought, uh, bought her 12 songs album. And if anybody else is interested in that, you could just email me at john, J-O-H-N at soberspeak.com and I'll get you in touch with Mary Lynn. But anyway, she says, uh, I love hearing all the stories of recovery that are shared on the podcast to understand the alcoholics in my life better and to be of service to other families and friends of alcoholics. Thanks for sharing their stories of recovery and hope. Well, you're welcome, Karen. And thank you for writing in. Natalie writes in and she says, hi, John, I'm an alcoholic in my third year. Me and other, me and three other ladies attended the Friday night where you had Cliff and Lori. She's talking about our Sober Speak Live event with Cliff and Lori. Two of the girls, she said, had to leave early and use the child care. Thank you. Uh, the other girl uh, and I didn't have any cash on hand, so this is in lieu of that. And she sent in some uh, a contribution. So thank you, Natalie. No, wasn't necessary, but but thank you anyway. And then she says, "Thank you so much for hosting. It was my first time hearing both sides, AA and Al-Anon. My husband, not an alcoholic, listened on Zoom at home while watching my toddler. Oh, that's cool." She says, "My home group." 
is the Carrollton group. Well, that's where I got sober, Natalie. She says, I consider a legacy Plano my second home. And this is where Mary Lynn, once again, Mary Lynn's came, came up. Mary Lynn's name come up again, uh, was a couple of weeks ago. And she promoted the event in a, on a flyer, which they also posted there in the highway. I took a picture and shared it with my girlfriends that came along to the event, two of which would not have come if it had not listed child care. Well, I'm glad they were able to come. Thank you, Natalie. And she says, thanks for your service, Natalie. Well, God bless you and your friends, and I'm glad you all were able to come to the event. We had a real good time. So anyway, thank you. Leonard writes in, and Leonard says, Hi, John. My lady and I uh, were on drugs. We had a dispute over my truck. She beat me up, split my head with a tire tool, and then had me arrested. Sounds like an exciting night, Leonard. And and then she was given possession of my truck. (laughs) Well, all right. And then he puts a big smiley face. So I'm hoping all that is behind him. Anyway, he says... Anyway, he says, I went to jail and they gave me a tablet and I discovered Sober Speak and I listened to it every day for six months. I really enjoyed the speakers and came away with a lot. I got out at the end of January. It turned out okay with a misdemeanor on the record. I joined the Facebook group and then I made a post one day when I was doing bad and through that sober speak community helped me to get connected with some people in my community, which is in the Denver area. Anyway, I appreciate this thing you have built. It's been quite a help for me. One thing uh, I found a sponsor here as a result of reaching out on the super secret Facebook group. And a month later, when I was erroneously arrested, he came and got me out of jail. Never in my life had anyone come and get me out of jail. I mean, I had the money, but, but even still he came and got me out. I did deserve the help cause I wasn't in the wrong, but I'm just saying thing saying through reaching out to your group and being sincere and recovery and good things are happening in my life. Good for you, my friend. And he says, I even got to go to the Broncos training camp, which was a dream come true for me. Thank you for everything. And I know your wife does a lot too. Thank you both, Leonard. Well, Leonard, let's hope your life gets a little less exciting here moving forward. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but I'm so glad that you wrote in, my friend, and I'm so glad you have sobriety and you have a sponsor uh, and you have people in your community that you can reach out to, and e- including the Facebook uh, group, uh, this, uh, our Facebook group. Anyway, <clears throat> all right, everybody, that's another one in the books. Um, keep coming back. It works if you work it. Uh, May God bless you and keep you until then. I take this all one week at a time. I hope to be back next week. And God bless y'all. Love you. Bye-bye.